For Want of Caution by Mayan Paw Chapter 7 Rise Up, O Flame Hobbes sat in the darkness, the muted world buzzing around him. Grief, pain, and exhaustion pulled at him, trying to lure him into the blissful oblivion of sleep. But Hobbes didn't want to sleep. He didn't want to meet the dream, didn't want to hear just how badly he had failed. He knew that once they were free, if they ever were free, he would never see dream again. After all, if a mistake overture of friendship was enough to put an end to their meetings, what would the murder of a beloved familiar get him? So no, Hob avoided sleeping with every ounce of strength that he had. But despite not sleeping, the nightmares found him anyway. He couldn't help but imagine how Jessamy died. Every scenario, every thought was poured over in his mind, until he could see it all like a violent movie that he could not escape from. Hob had gone hunting before, had shot birds before. It was all too easy for him to imagine taking aim, the target switching to black in his memory, and firing the pain from the beating close enough to mimic the pain from the recoil. Did you get to see this guy one last time before she was shot, or was she murdered without having ever felt fresh air in her lungs again? He tortured himself with it over and over and over again. A distant, logical part of him knew that it wasn't healthy, that it wouldn't help him and dream. But that tiny, distant voice was overruled. Hob knew that he deserved to suffer because even if he hadn't pulled the trigger personally, he might as well have. Hob could barely look over at Dream, and every time he did, the wave of suffocating guilt crashed down upon him again. Dream had curled himself up into a small ball on the floor of the cage. From his angle, Hob could make out the stream of tears coming from unseeing eyes, and it hit him all over again that he had caused this, forcing him to look away in shame and spiraling back down into his own pool of grief. Around them, the guards came and went. Some taunted them both, others ignored them, sending vague looks of pity in their direction. Everyone seemed to know that something had happened, however, something that was enough to break not only Hob, but the stoic granite wall that had been dreamed. Eventually, though, the parade of guards slowed down, and Hob was stuck with two of his least favorite guards, Murphy and Morris. Morris was an annoying imbecile. He had the habit of constantly fiddling with his pocket watch. The sound of the clasp opening and shutting over and over again was like fingernails on a chalkboard daub, and whenever Morris tired of that, he would switch over to singing radio tunes under his breath, with all of the words wrong. Murphy, however, set off every alarm in Hob's mind. The way that his eyes roamed hungrily over Dream's exposed form, the way that a cruel smirk appeared every time that Hob winced from pain, all of it sent Hob's skin crawling. Murphy was the type of man who took this type of job not for the ample paycheck, but for the love of the work. The two of them, on one shift together, had Hob on high alert, desperately trying to push his overwhelming grief aside out of necessity. The first sign that something was off was that Morris took longer to come back from his smoke break than usual. Five minutes passed, then ten. By fifteen minutes, Murphy had not only realized that something was up, but was now looking anxiously at the clock. For a moment, Hob thought that Murphy might actually be worried for Morris, but one look at the silver cigarette case in his hand made Hob think otherwise, and that the man was simply anxious for his chance at his nicotine. Hob held his breath, hopeful anticipation growing without his permission. What's stronger, his fear of Burgess or his craving for that cigarette? Finally, the man stood up, having clearly made up his mind. Don't fucking move, Murphy snapped curtly at Hob. I'll know if you have. Scales on him, Hob said with a shitty grin. The man scowled in response, but then looked back longingly at the stairs. He ran over to the column and tugged on the chains, checking both the lock and the cuffs. Satisfied that they weren't going anywhere, he then turned and ran up the stairs, leaving Hob alone with Dream for the first time in a week. Hob started pulling desperately at the chains. In all honesty, he knew that there was no likelihood that they were going to give, especially not since Murphy has just checked their integrity. But this was the first time that they had been left unguarded, and Hob planned to use every second of it. Once that attempt failed, achieving only sore wrists and a newfound hatred for the improvement in modern lockmaking craftsmanship, Hob then tried stretching towards the binding circle, praying that he could possibly reach the edges with his shoes. He 
He actually hadn't had the chance to try this yet since the last time that he had been unguarded down here. He had been distracted by the appearance of Jack. Hob shook his head, not even allowing himself to finish her name. You don't have time to fall apart again, Hobbsy. They could be back at any moment. So he went back to trying desperately to reach the edge of the circle. The cuffs dug sharply into his already raw wrists, promising new bruises, and he pulled at the chains, trying frantically to get any additional length out of them. The golden paint tantalizingly close. A part of him regretted that he had only been threatened with the rack back during his trial for witchcraft. I could definitely use an extra inch or two right about now, he thought darkly. He gave up with a sigh. There was no way that he was reaching the circle, not while he was still in the cuffs. He eyed the cuffs warily. While he had heard a rumor that dislocating or breaking your thumbs would let you slip out of them, he wasn't sure if he wanted to attempt that just yet. He wasn't completely sure about the outcome, and knowing his luck, they'd probably heal wrong. Besides, there's always the chance that a Jess will do it for you. So thoughtful, that man. Hob heard the sound of the upstairs door opening, pulling him out of his thoughts. Time's up. He had hoped to accomplish more than give himself some new bruises, but instead of a balding Morris, a young man that he had never seen before made his way down the stairs and opened up the barred gates. He walked forward, eyes wide in shock. Oh, my God! Hob sat up. None of the guards or any of the other people that he had seen down here had ever reacted like that. Hobbs' movement must have cut through whatever haze the other man had been feeling because his eyes zeroed in on Hobb. "'Are you Hob Gadling?' he asked, gently putting down a lumpy burlap bag that he carried. Hob froze. The only person outside of this room who knew that name was responsible for Jessamine's murder. "'Why?' Hob snarled, his voice ice. The young man took a step back, eyes wide in shock. "'Alex—' "'Alex said that you needed help.' Burning fury rose within Hob. The last time that I let him help me, someone wound up dead. He looked confused for a second before it melted away into realization. Oh! He breathed. Hob watched with distrust as he then reached down into the bag at his feet and pulled up. Jessamy? He croaked in disbelief. It's not possible. He'd seen her body himself. The damp, rusty stain was still there just a feet to his left. But so, too, was the disgruntled-looking black-and-white raven sitting in the man's hands. She shook herself, rewriting the few mislaid feathers, and then leapt out of the man's grasp, soaring across the room and landing on the chain of the glass cage, right at the room's eye level. The man looked absolutely wretched. Tears were flowing freely down his face, and Dream looked at her like she was a wish made solid. Hobbit certainly had enough dreams like that after both Eleanor and Robin died ones where they would appear to him happy and whole, even as he knew they were gone. He was not entirely convinced that that wasn't what was happening now. Jessamy? Dream's voice was a soft and fragile thing, almost childlike, and so unlike the man that Hob had known for the last five centuries that it was enough to send Hob over the edge. Oh, he sobbed, asking the man as he came over to where Hob was chained. The man shrugged and looked distinctly uncomfortable. A lot of birds are black. Hob looked back at the glass globe. Dream had pressed his forehead against the glass, and the little bird mirrored him. My name's Paul, by the way. The curly-haired man reached out his hand for a handshake. Hob looked down at his own chained hands. It is really nice to meet you, Paul. I'd shake your hands, but... He jangled the chains meaningfully. Paul laughed. I think I can help with that. He reached down into the burlap sack and rummaged around. The sound of metal clanking together had Hob trying to peer into the bag his curiosity peak. Yes, he said, holding two keys aloft in victory. These things always fall to the bottom of stuff. He took the metal into his calloused hands, and Hob watched riveted as the small delicate key was inserted into the lock and watched with wonder as the metal fell away from his wrists, leaving him free for the first time in weeks. The feeling of the air over his exposed skin sent shivers throughout his body, and his arms felt buoyant without the heavy metal pulling them down. Hob went to stand but fell forward onto his knees, his bloodless legs confused after so long in confinement. Paul reached over and helped him up, and Hob stumbled to his feet. Despite the sharp pain that shot through his legs, it felt incredible to be standing on his own for the first time in so long. 
What are you helping us? Hob couldn't help but ask. He knew that he should be grateful, shouldn't question anything, but he just couldn't understand it. Because Alex asked me to. Paul said as if that explained everything. Although given the lovesick look that crossed the man's face when he said Alex's name, Hob supposed that it, it did explain everything. So if Alex wanted to help us so much, why the hell did he torture us like that, making us think that Chesame was dead? Hob struggled to get the last word out, the residual fear and grief strangling his throat. Paul straightened up defensively. How else do you think that I could have gotten access to your keys? Paul deflated. Listen, I understand that you are rightfully upset. I can't imagine how you felt, but the Magus wanted her dead, and he also wanted a son who wanted her dead. Alex and I realized that if we could give him what he wanted, not just Jessamy's death, but a son who would follow in his footsteps, then he would freely give us the information that we needed to get everyone out of here. The young man's eyes darkened. The Magus is currently under the impression that his latest beating finally set Alex straight. Hab winced, but the memory of the overwhelming fear and grief refused to leave him. So what, you just manipulated us, knowing exactly how badly we'd react? Paul shrugged. You sold it better than we ever could. Hab hated it. He hated that Paul was right. Hated that he had played exactly into the role that they had needed him to. And he hated that he was still hurt and angry. So where the hell is Alex now? Paul's face clouded with worry. He's with the Magus, getting the grimoire and his other things. Paul said, motioning towards Dream. Does he really think that Roderick Pajess will just hand them over to him? No. The young man whispered, looking down at the ground. He took a second of silence, but then steeled himself, putting back on a false smile. But I promised him that I'd help free both of you, so here I am. Ab wanted so badly to hold on to his anger at the two young men. Let them face the fallout of their choices alone as payment for their treatment of Hob and of Dream. But then he looked at Jessamy so vibrantly and so impossibly alive, and he couldn't. Well, we can't let Alex have all of the fun now, can we? Hob said. Paul looked up joyful, disbelief chasing away the fear. No, we can't, he said firmly. He then reached down into his bag and brought out two crowbars, shyly holding one out to Hob. I figured that you might want to help me with this part. The metal was cold and heavy in his hands. Hob hadn't slept in over 24 hours, hadn't had anything except bread and water for over a week, and he was riddled with bruises and most likely fractured bones. But oh, how he would always have enough strength for this. A destructive grin crossed his face. You think it correctly. Together they walked over to the globe, dream-watching them with hungry anticipation. Hob swung the crowbar back, ready to take the first hit, when a thought stopped him. Why? Dream looked at Hob with confused betrayal. Jessamy, he said, addressing the little bird sitting on top of the cage, I believe that there was something that you told me that you wished to do. She let out a croaking, warbling note and then swooped down onto the stone, landing before the golden circle. She tilted her head at it and then bent down, scraping her beak repeatedly across the stone. The noise set Hob's teeth on edge, yet with each pass and each golden flick that was lifted away, it quickly became the sweetest sound that he had ever heard. Soon enough, there was a clear, clean break through the gold intricate lettering. Is that it? He asked. He had been expecting something to happen once the binding circle had been broken. Did it work? Yes, it did. Dream said breathlessly, sitting forward. Hob looked over at Paul. What then, then? The first impact was jarring, the force vibrating up his arms. Hob was disappointed to find only a small scratch marring the otherwise smooth surface. He knew that he wouldn't have shattered it on the first swing, but he had hoped to at least have made a larger difference. He felt Paul pull him back, and Paul took his own turn, slamming the crowbar into glass at full strength, leaving a similar mark on the globe. Together they fell into a rhythm, trading off blows, until at last a fine crack appeared in the scratched surface. Hub watched with bated breath as the crack splintered outwards, creating a spider web of fine fractures. Dream, move away from the edge, Hob said, anticipation building like a wave about the crest. 
The man moved instantly and looked up at Hob, his blue eyes shimmering with hope, excitement, and so many other emotions that it stole the breath from Hob's lungs. He shook his head, breaking the connection. Stay focused. Hob picked the crowbar back up and brought it back, his burning muscles screaming at him for their overuse. Last one. He let loose the swing, pouring every moment of fear, every sensation of pain, every ounce of anger into it. A guttural yell erupted from his throat, further fueling him on. Metal hit glass. For one heart-stopping second, nothing happened. And then, like water returning after a drought, the grass shattered. Fine, sharp shreds rained down around him, and Hob instinctively ducked, trying to avoid the worst of the deluge. But all of that was quickly forgotten as a bright blue light formed within the formerly impenetrable sphere. Tendrils of radiance whipped out from the churning ball, and a wind from nowhere swept up blowing dust and sand around them. Dream pulled himself up and through the iron cradle that had held him for ten years, his body parting the luminous vapors like fog, and landed softly on the stone floor. No care heeded for the shards of glass underneath his feet, glittering in the icy glare. Over the howling wind, Hob could hear him take his first fresh breath of air in a decade, the thought enough to bring tears to Hob's eyes. The beautiful blinding sun cast Dream's face in his shadow, and he was wreathed in an ethereal glow. It struck Hob once again that his friend, this being, was so much more than human. Dream's eyes locked onto Hob, staring down into his very soul. Thank you, Hob Gadling. His voice reverberated throughout the room and down into Hob's bones. But before Hob could respond, Dream was turning, looking backwards as the wind changed directions. The ball floated up and out of the iron, becoming the center of the vortex as the wind and sand were swept up and inwards towards the increasingly blinding star. Dream faced the onslaught head-on, and Hob watched in amazement, as he was lifted upwards and pulled into the eye of the storm. The light became painfully blinding, forcing Hob to look away. And just as suddenly as it started, it was over. The light, the wind, dream, gone, leaving behind a deafening stillness and a fine layer of sand coating every surface. Hob and Paul stood in shock, neither able to comprehend what had happened. But Jessamy let out a loud cough, shattering the silence. Both men turned to stare at her, and she leapt up into the air, flying up and out of the basement. For a beat, no one else moved, and then Hob was running after her, following without thought or hesitation. He could hear Paul right behind him as his dress shoes slipped on the sand-covered glass. He sprinted up the stairs and out into the hallway. It would have felt surreal being in such a new place after so long, but Hob was far too focused on locating the sound of flapping wings to let such a thought distract him. He similarly dismissed the sights of Murphy and Morris, their motionless bodies, meaningless, as he raced down the labyrinthine hallways. He took each twist and turn as fast as he could, knocking roughly into the walls rather than slow down by a millisecond. He was gaining on Jessamy. He could make out her dark wings as she flew ahead of him, leading the way. She soared through an open mahogany door, and Hob skidded in after her, finding themselves in Roderick Burgess's study. The man in question was lying catatonic on the ground. His eyes were screwed tightly shut, drool dribbled from his lax mouth, and every few seconds he let out a moan or a violent flinch. Standing over him was Alex and Dream, once again draped in a resplendent heavy black coat. A rich red ruby sat in the pronounced hollow of his throat, and in one hand he held a ghastly-looking helm, like the combination of a gas mask and the spine of an animal. With the other, he reached out and grabbed the thick book that Alex was holding out and offering. He brought it into the folds of his coat, and when he removed his hand, the book was gone. Jessamy landed on Dream's shoulder and rubbed her head affectionately on his cheek. In response, Dream brought his hand up and lovingly ran his fingers over her feathers. The man looked around them, deep blue, serious eyes, taking in everything. He then reached deep into his coat, and when he brought his hand out... Sand was streaming smoothly and endlessly from between his fingers. Without warning, Dream threw it up into the air, and then both he and Jessamy were gone, disappearing into a swirl of sand that left them all behind.